Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at iron and steel, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and the role of scientists. We hear now from Professor Keith Greaves about agriculture. I'm Keith Greaves. I'm a professor at Kingston University. I've had a long-standing research interest in British society in the era of the Great War, particularly in the course of the war in the countryside and the effects of the war on rural societies in the British Isles. In the early months of war, in 1914, there were a number of recruitment posters which depicted the countryside, the very idealised view of the countryside given the very limited number of people of the overall populations of the British Isles who actually lived in the countryside. The depiction emphasised that it was a country or a land worth fighting for. There had been, in the years before the outbreak of war, a back-to-the-land process, an emphasis on the discovery of the countryside through transport developments. There had been ways of getting to the country areas more. And around many metropolitan areas was a sense of beloved landscapes which could be enjoyed on Sundays and on bank holidays. Those town visitors to rural areas saw a landscape which enabled them to understand a private patriotism, an attachment to the land for which they might fight. This land had undergone significant economic change in the generation before. In an era of free trade with very cheap corn across international markets, there was very little possibility of maintaining a high wheat price. So with England, there had been a considerable transfer to livestock farming. The emphasis on meat and milk as a means of profitability had significantly undercut the wheat growing emphasis that had existed until the 1870s. In that sense, there was a crisis Grazing and the commitment of capital to grazing meant that farmers were managing to survive, often on small farms, with very limited margins, with a sense that the state was apart from them. In 1914, Britain has a sufficiency of milk supplies, but imports 80% of all wheat, at least 40% of all meat products perhaps 75% all its fruit-related products. The understanding is that the cheap corn will continue to be supplied from the United States, Canada and Australia. The sea lanes will be protected. The supplies will still arrive from Russia and Romania. There will be superabundance. And though the price may rise, the price can be afforded Farmers will be encouraged to produce more food at home because the price might rise and they may benefit. But to do that, they will need the labour to remain on the land, the horses for work on the land, and a very secure sense from the government that their work is valued and that they are an integral part of the war effort. That understanding is not available in August 1914. At the outbreak of war, the strategic policy is that agriculture does not have a vital role to play in the defence of the nation. And the Admiralty is assuring the home population that everyone ought to sleep safely in their beds. The Board of Agriculture is a junior department with limited access to the War Cabinet and a very small inspectorate. In 1914 and 1915, the Board of Agriculture does not believe that it can intervene 
to secure controls and developments that would improve home food supply. In reading the journal of the Board of Agriculture, there is the sense that farmers are being advised. Manuring would be an example. There is lots of advice that despite the rising cost of manure, it really would be in the farmer's interests to do heavy top dressings because they will benefit from the increased value of their crop. But the farmer's interest is not yet the national interest. Although farmers themselves become indispensable as a category of worker, in 1916, there is a very considerable debate in 1915 on what the definition of a farmer might be. Because they could occupy a very small farm, they could be the manager of a very large farm, they might have retired, it might actually be the sons and daughters who are the farmers, but not necessarily on the census return. This is part of the problem of understanding who to protect from military service. In June 1915, the president of the Board of Agriculture, Lord Selborne, is able to appoint a committee to inquire into how food production can increase after the 1916 harvest in case the war needs to be continued beyond the Somme offensive. Lord Milner's committee for England reports alongside committees for Ireland and Scotland. They all recommend that there are emergency measures as if the Board of Agriculture needs to become a controlled industry, in effect. Milner's committee proposed thoroughgoing interventions for which the state would take responsibility. Increased labour supply, minimum wages mechanisation, and a minimum guaranteed price for wheat, in order that farmers be confident that if they start to invest in their farms to increase output, that they will have guaranteed prices for doing so. And that this arrangement will not only take place for the duration of the war, but will continue after the war. The Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, responds by suggesting that this is deeply contentious, that there is insufficient parliamentary time for its consideration, and also assured the committee that he did not think that submarines would affect the flow of wheat to the British Isles. The President of the Board of Agriculture, Lord Selborne, striving to improve home food production, fears that he is caught between free trade on one side and farmers who want to protect their interests on the other. So although there is concern about the extent of the wheat reserve, which sometimes fall to as low as eight weeks, there is an understanding in 1915 and well into 1916 that allied coordination of purchasing of wheat will stabilise the prices and will enable that wheat to still flow towards the British ports. In the autumn and winter of 1916 into 1917, harvest conditions deteriorate. The supply of wheat from across the world becomes far more difficult to manage and the prices increase greatly. On the fall of Asquith's coalition government in December 1916, the opportunity arises for a range of new ministries organised by the new Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. A food production department was created within the Board of Agriculture. The new president of the Board of Agriculture, Roland Prothero, a land agent for the Duke of Bedford, had a very clear sense of the landlord's caution and concern about overextending their financial commitments on the land. Also appointed was Arthur Lee, one of Lloyd George's leading hustlers, a man whose publicity-seeking engagements 
did not always win favour with senior conservative politicians. The Food Production Department developed county war agricultural executive committees. In every county, in England, Wales and Scotland, they were given authority for land cultivation orders, often negotiated, but if necessary, imposed. In January 1917, the Defence of the Realm legislation enabled a cultivation of lands order which required land of whatever size to be tilled for cereals if the committees, with their local knowledge, deemed it appropriate. This was within the context of a new commitment to ploughing up land. The food production department were referred to by some farmers as plough maniacs. And there are records that show that some isolated fields on very high ground, which was very inaccessible, was still required to be ploughed up. There were local debates managed by members of the committees at county level who were themselves farmers advising and sometimes instructing other farmers to make changes for additional acreage for cereal crops just in time for the 1917 harvest, but in particular in planning for the 1918 harvest. The county committees also deployed additional labour, which came from nearby barracks and included the formation of the Women's Land Army. Members of the Women's Land Army were instructed to become specialist workers on the land, such as motor drivers and thatchers, and to lead horses. Their contribution has become very well known because it was emphasised by the government as a significant new contribution. It also emphasised the woman on the land as a temporary worker, nationally organised, with a weekly wage, and very visible in their uniforms. Some of these were described as educated women, and they were often from towns. In the countryside, there were numerous groups of temporary workers supplementing the labour of those who had remained on the land because they were older, very young, or they were conscientious objectors, or prisoners of war. And the Women's Land Army is an important part of that, as are resident village women, who are less visible in labour surveys, because they were often part-time, work seasonally, may have worked on the land in their villages before the war, had also perhaps gone to munitions factories and were now being encouraged to return to their home villages to help with the 1917 harvest. So by 1917, the emphasis on increasing the supply of corn has become so important that the production of food takes its place as an essential area of war work to the extent that military service tribunals will sometimes allow skilled labour of military age to remain harvesters on the land. In 1917, it's as important to have an allotment and work on it with a spade as it is to plough on a larger field. Those who ploughed and those who used their spade on allotments, they were being encouraged to think of themselves as a land army, as having an equivalence to Kitchener's new armies two years before. Counties were mobilising themselves again, this time to increase food production and not just in the wheat-growing counties of eastern England. This involves some skilled ploughmen returning from the British armies in France to take in the harvest in the fields in 1917. A skilled agriculturalist is generally kept on the land until the German spring offensive in March 1918 
which requires a further quota of men from this industry for the British armies in France. While there is very great concern about an invasion threat on the East Coast, there is the sense that soldiers might best work on the fields. There are numerous examples of local harvester gangs who are essentially soldiers still in uniform who temporarily have been made available to county war executive committees in order that the fields be tilled and that the harvest be taken in. One of the most important technological innovations in agriculture is the availability of tractors, specifically the Ministry of Munitions tractor, MOM tractor, manufactured by Henry Ford and Son. A contract for 5,000 tractors in 1917 was completed. Indeed, a further 1,000 tractors was added to that order, and the tractors were shipped across the Atlantic. The tractor is an example of a field munition. The irony of these field munitions is that they had to be imported because Ransoms, Fowlers and other premier agricultural engineers had been producing munitions, including tanks. The tractors are available in large numbers, though there will always be a debate about the extent of their deployment, especially on upland farms. There were numerous reliability issues. The tractors were without brakes, they had three gears, and the radiator had to become a little heavier to keep the whole machine on the ground. They were not ideal on heavy arable land. Nonetheless, they are recorded as being deployed locally because they were often owned by the committees at county level and by the food production department. This deployment is an example of cooperative farming through national organisation with machinery and implements and artificial manures. This marks out a level of organisation that was completely unforeseen in 1914. In 1918, the deployment of these tractors grows still further and they become sufficiently successful for farmers to wish to own tractors. The MOM tractor becomes a Fordson F model, beloved of agricultural shows and still seen lovingly restored and maintained in some rural areas. After the German Spring Offensive of 1918, when even further supplies of men were needed for the British armies in France, it became clear that the ambitious scheme for the harvest in 1919 could not be maintained. The war policy on agriculture, it could be argued, comes to a pause in July 1918. At that stage, farmers would still expect a guaranteed price for corn and that that would be available for many years to come, which would not be the case. So in the history of wartime agriculture, historians often refer to a temporary intervention and have debated very fully whether there is structural change. The structural change may come more from land sales after the war and the reverse of the corn production incentive, which by 1921 is no longer available. Farmers then face the prospect of being encouraged to buy their acreage from a landowner who may be selling the estate at the very time that their farms require maintenance and still more capital to cover the years when it has not been possible to carefully maintain and repair all the structures and buildings on the farm. So the situation at the end of the war is still potentially difficult. And soon after the war, there will be the sense amongst many farmers of a betrayal 
given their commitment to the nation's cause in 1917. But the land becomes important in a further way. Men and women have fought for this land. Small holdings is one of the responses that governments provide. Legislation to support the purchase of small holdings by county councils and many private charitable schemes to help disabled men settle on the land gives the sense that men and women who have fought for their country are entitled to plough the land that they sought to defend. So at the end of the war, there is a considerable impulse to support the small producer on a small holding as part of a better life. These small holdings will encounter very real difficulties in the 1920s. But there is a vision, and the vision is to translate the life that has been lived and the sacrifice that has been made on the fighting fronts into an improvement on the home front and a post-war experience which will in some way compensate for the service and sacrifice of the wartime years. At the same time, land becomes available in recreational ways as more and more tracts of land such as hilltops and meadows, river walks and fields themselves become part of the National Trust estate. In the years 1918 to 1925, there are numerous examples of farmland which is handed to the National Trust in remembrance of the lives lost in the Great War. These local acts of remembrance suggest that service to the country can be understood to be valuing the land and the beautiful settings that are on the doorsteps of towns and cities in the British Isles. That was Professor Keith Greaves on agriculture. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Roy McLeod about the role of scientists during the First World War.